Okay, so again, welcome to the Flippin School Committee meeting for April 26th, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15th, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Plimpton School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public has been permitted, but every effort has been made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order using Zoom either by computer or telephone. This meeting is being recorded for informational purposes only and is not considered to be a public record. So the first order of business uh, this evening is to open the school choice public hearing. Uh, so since this is a public hearing, um, we are going to, uh, we're going to first um, sort of reach out and see if folks have uh, any information that they would like to provide uh, in favor of school choice at the Dennett, uh, and then see if anyone has any information that they would like to provide uh, to um, against that. Uh, and when that is all the evidence is collected, we will then um, uh, close the evidence gathering and we will move to uh, the deliberation on that point. Um, certainly the school committee members are free to ask questions as we go through this part of it, but we will save our deliberations till the deliberation part of that. So I would like to start off and see if anyone has uh, any comments that they would like to make in favor of um, putting um, uh, doing school choice again this year. And so, uh, Mike, if you would like to, Mike M, if you'd like to speak, please do so. Good evening, members of the school committee of Plimpton. My name is Michael Martin, um, and I am asking you this evening to open up your school for open enrollment to my soon to be fifth grade son. He is currently in fourth grade. Um, so I am a little bit about that. Um, so we are currently residents within the Silver Lake Regional School District. Um, so that would not place an undue burden on the Silver Lake Regional Schools um, as my older two children are attending the Silver Lake Regional Schools currently. Um, my son is also not a special education student, so you would not put an excess burden of financial extra services on the Plimpton um, School District. And as a parent, I am just seeking uh, the best possible education for my son. And as a teacher at Silver Lake Regional High School, I've heard wonderful things about Dead Elementary from numerous people. Um, and I'm just hoping that you will uh, open your doors as you have previously on a case-by-case -case basis um, to my son for next school year and his sixth grade school year before he would transition to uh, the Silver Lake Regional Schools. Uh, I can answer any questions you may have about this and I just thank you for your time and consideration and I know you will put your uh, constituents, your the people that live within Plimpton first in regards to this and thank you very much for your time. Okay, does, does, do any of the school committee members have any questions uh, for Michael? Um, I have some questions in general, not specifically to Michael, actually. Uh, John, uh, you or somebody else on the committee could probably answer, or I'm sure Jill or Peter, but uh, I'm not too familiar with this, uh, this particular program. I understand what it is. I, I know what it is, but the, the semantics of it. So a couple part question is um, the definitely to Peter, uh, are we close to our max capacity in the fifth grade? Would that one extra person burden us with uh, social distancing and, and things of the like in, in spite of the COVID-19? In keeping it six feet, that would, it would really push our limits, yes. Okay. Well, I think um, the clarification is that the, the student will be in fifth grade next year. The student is currently a fourth grade student. Okay, yeah, so for the fifth grade, would that, same, same question. Um, well, actually, I think that was kind of the question, but uh, so as far as fifth grade or even sixth grade, if it were to extend to the second year, is that going to present a spacing problem for us as the CDC and state uh, guidelines stand today? As the numbers stand right now, I would say no. Okay. Um, and cost-wise, um, 
the whatever town it is, uh, Mike, that you're coming from, I, I want to say Halifax, is that correct? No, it, it's got to be Halifax. Sorry, I'm sorry, it, it, it's on mute. Yes, it is Halifax. That is correct. I, I, I kind of answer my own question because you're older children in the in the district. But um, so now, what does Halifax contribute to Plimpton, and do we pick up any additional cost on top of what Halifax um, gives for this program? Go ahead, Jill. So. Um, School choice tuition for students in a regular education program is $5,000 per student. Um, in terms of the cost to educate a child, that, that varies, um, but um, that's what schools are given for a school choice program. If you were to open up one opening and multiple applicants applied, you would have to randomly select the student. Okay, and I mean, it's kind of like, you know, me being in transportation with the T, if the, the MBT is running a train, it's going to cost them X amount of money to run that train, whether there's five people or 50 people on that. Is that a, a similar scenario for the education side of it? Is it not going to cost us any more unless we get into special education type programs? Or is the $5,000 sufficient to our cost? For taking on another student or close to it. Yeah, I, I, th I think it depends. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's, you know, because you have an average cost per student at the Dennett. Mm -hmm. And I believe it is more than 5000. That said, if you have like, uh, like our current sixth grade, where you have a significant under enrollment, just demographically, that is why part of the reason why we opened that up was because even though there may be some ancillary costs, it was better for the class overall to have additional students in it. Yeah. And so there was an additional benefit um, to, to the Dennett and to the students within that class to have additional students there. Yeah, so I would almost kind of like my example with the, the commuter rail, if, if they're gonna run a train for $1,000, they can put 30 more people on that. It's not going to change the cost, maybe just meals and stuff like that for lunches. So, so in a sense, we, we wouldn't incur out of pocket expenses that we weren't already recognizing for the most part. It's in addition. It's to the plan. Okay. It, it's not, it's not as easy to say exactly because we, we don't have a calculator for what each student costs per se. It's all averages. So in theory, it, if it was in excess, it'd be probably a negligible, negligible amount then. Fair to say. I think that's been our experience so far. Okay. And, and Mike, I, I hope you know, I'm not pulling this apart to as a as a dig towards you. I, I just I, I had these questions just in general, because I'm new to the school committee and in growing up in the city, uh, the, there was none of this. Um, yeah, there were so many schools in, in the city that I grew up in that uh, you just went to the one closest to you. And if that didn't work, tough cookies. Right. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm aware as a, as a teacher, I'm aware of kind of the, the circumstances of this. And so I'm just reaching out to, to, you know, to potentially do what I feel is best for my child. So yeah, no, I, I apologize if it seems like I'm. No, no, I, 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 under, I understand this can go either way um, and am fine either way you choose. I would love to join uh, for my son to join Dennett. Um, but if you so choose not to tonight, I completely understand um how this works so again thank you very much for your consideration absolutely i get all my questions answered i'm i'm pretty comfortable with it now thank you i appreciate it and sorry it was at your expense okay does anyone else want to want to speak for school choice at this point john i just have a question if i could yeah um so we, uh mike um is is something um happening in, in Halifax? Uh, is it um, is it classroom size for, for that? Uh, so, so the big, uh, I mean, some of my personal experiences I'll keep to myself, um, but the, the biggest thing is um, one of the reasons why we chose to live within this district was the classroom size. 
Um, so, and my son happens to be, I think, part of the largest class ever to go through Halifax Elementary. Um, so those, those, that grade level does have upwards of, at times has had 27 um, kids in a class, um, where my other children have had, you know, 18 to 20 in a class um, in the other grades. So that, that is the most significant reason why, you know, I'm asking for this is just that, um, you know, again, to provide what I feel is the best situation for my son. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, any any comments or evidence to uh, to keep school choice closed from folks that are on the call? Okay. So. Uh, seeing that there's no additional evidence to be gathered then uh, we will close sort of the evidence gathering portion of this hearing and now we'll move to deliberations so uh, now that we're at that point do other school committee members want to speak uh, about school choice jason so um, dan just to give historical context to the school choice situation we have currently in plimpton um, we had an extremely small class size coming into the kindergarten about seven years ago, and we were faced with potentially having to cut a teacher. And working with the finance committee and working with Peter, um, we arrived at this as being one of the ways we could potentially bring some revenue into the town and we could maintain two sections at each grade level. Um, you know, the dynamics would have been extraordinary over the seven years, uh, because every year we would have had to shift teachers between grade levels. Um, and it also would have had some social emotional impact where those kids would have been in the same classrooms with the same exact kids for seven years, having no years off, even with sometimes your best friend, you need a year away from them just to recoup and, you know, gather yourself back together. We wouldn't have had those options. So, um, the debate about opening school choice in Plimpton was pretty extensive, even under those circumstances. Um, but we did finally arrive at that as a, that was our best solution for the kids of Plimpton. And we were lucky to get some wonderful families um, who put their names into the lottery. And we made a commitment to those families that if they helped us in the time of need, that we, we, we would take their siblings. And that's one of the only times in school choice where you can actually select what students you get is the siblings of students who are already school choice in your school. So as much as I would love to help Mike out and, and take his son in, the situation is when we open up a slot in any grade level, if there's more than one applicant or more applicants than we have slots available, it becomes a lottery system. Um, you know, and I can tell you that there's awesome situations in school choice. We've had some here in Dennett, um, but I can also tell you there's some real horror stories about school choice students coming into communities after they haven't been successful in their home communities. Um, so um, I understand what you're saying, but we're running a train. We can put some more bodies on it, but our average per pupil um, expenditure in, in Plimpton is about $11,000 per pupil a year. And we get about $5,000 from school choice. Now I'm sure um, you know a regular ed student coming into the fifth grade would cost us less than eleven thousand um, dollars, but there's all of these dynamics we have to take into consideration. And one of the last and probably the least sensitive items to mention is, you know, one of the incentives to move into our town is being part of our community in Plimpton, in Dennett, and having the opportunity to come to our elementary school. So we just need to be careful. Um, that we don't become like some of the schools on the North Shore, where over 40% of their students are school choice students. We have to be very deliberative. We have to be very careful to maintain that balance. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's funny you bring that up because before I bought in Plimpton 20 plus years ago, we were looking on the North Shore and that was a whole thing up there. And I was like, what? what? You just go to whatever school they, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, oh no, we can just go to Hamilton Lennon, you know? And, um, you know, just a very big thing up there that, that the North Shore is pretty open for, for moving around. Um, do uh, Dan or Mike, do you have any other comments? Um, I, another question. Uh, 
just brought up from what uh, Jason said. So, so if we open up this slot, it's not specifically for Mike. We, we, in some fashion, put out a public notice that now, is it just for the fifth grade, which is what we're talking about now for next year, or is it just carte blanche? I was going to say, and Jason, jump in. It, it's it's how we deem it. We we we, okay. we decide what we want to open. We can open one grade, two grades, all grades, the number of slots per grade. You know, you could open three in first grade, one in second grade, four in fourth grade, right? Um, so we have that ability to choose. Where we don't have the ability to choose, other than for siblings, is who gets that slot if more than one person, if more, if more people apply for the available positions that we make open, then it's, then it's a, it's a, it's a random lottery. And if this, is this an annual thing or is it like, uh, I know Mike's child is going into fifth grade. So if it, if they started in first, are they automatically locked in until sixth? Yes. So if, if we were to make a slot open in fifth, then the student that gets into that slot would be able to attend for sixth. They don't have to attend. I mean, they could but go they, back. But they have a guaranteed but, spot. But they, we, would, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be, because we don't reopen, Jason, we don't reopen school choice for sixth grade. We just, it's, no, it's, it's sort of, once you let them in, they can go through the whole time. Yeah. So if you let someone in kindergarten, they go through till sixth grade without yeah. By DESE regulation, we have to have a public hearing on school choice every single year. If we decline to have this hearing, we automatically become a school choice school. So by having this hearing, we have control over how school choice happens in, in Dennett. Um, but yes, once a student is accepted, that student continues through our K-6 to program. However, we have found out um, in the seven years we've had school choice that if a student applies to an opening from an out of Silver Lake school system, um, Silver Lake middle school and high school are obligated to take those students. Uh, so in essence, we are taking away their autonomy to make that choice um, by making the choice here at, at the K to six level. Okay, and if, if you wouldn't mind, two more questions for Mike and then I'll get off the soapbox and, and leave you guys alone. Um, like you, uh, do you have uh, any children that are younger siblings to this child that you're looking to get into the fifth grade? No, I don't. I just, I have a, a mom that's going to be in seventh grade next year. And then another one who's going to be joining the high school as a freshman next year. Okay. So you can kind of see the direction I was going with the siblings, you know, where they're going to be two more younger siblings yep. that are jumping into the Senate. Yeah. And the second question in Please, if I'm imposing and you, you'd rather not answer, there's no hard feelings. But you mentioned you're a teacher. Are you? Do you happen to be a teacher in Halifax? A simple yes or no is fine, or you don't have to answer if it's an inappropriate question. I, I think I think Mike Mike could. Oh. I was going to say I, Mike could say. I, it's I, I think it's Mr. Cadigan cut out for a second. I did not hear a second question. Oh, so the second question, and if you, if it's inappropriate or you'd rather not answer, if yeah. you not to, are you, you mentioned you were a teacher. Are you a teacher in Halifax or other somewhere else? It doesn't matter where. I'm at, the, I'm at, I'm at Silver Lake Regional High School. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's all my questions. I appreciate sure. it. No problem. Thank you. Mike, do you have any, Mike Antone, do you have any questions or anything you want to bring up? Any comments? So, so John, does this, does this open up um, another, will this, will this open up another uh, hearing for, for applications that will get in because of this? Or I guess I understand what Jason was talking about um, where it would impact Silver Lake because uh, we talked about that at a few civil lake meetings um, with the school choice. Does, what does this what does this one do for us? If, do we have to open it up again? No. So if we if we were to decide tonight to uh, open school choice for any of the grades, uh, that would then that would then become an, uh, the administration would deal with. With that piece of it. So if, if we said, well, let, we're going to open up a slot in fifth grade, 
then that would go over and we would put out the appropriate notifications. The applications would be provided. Uh, should there only be one application, then that's pretty straightforward. If there are more than one, then we would there would have to be a lottery done by the administration in order to choose which student was able to uh, to get that slot. Um, we would not have an additional hearing. Uh, the other the other point here that that sort of resolves the Silver Lake issue is that because uh, Mike's son lives in Halifax, they're already in district, so there isn't any effect on from school choice as to whether the student would attend Silver Lake or not. They would if we if we were to not have a school choice slot open, they would still attend Silver Lake. So by being in district, it resolves that issue, um, but it still it still leaves us um, it still leaves us with um, uh, sort of with where we are. And I see Ms. Goodman's question there. What if the, if there's a lottery and the child has a sibling? Well, that, that's sort of where the, that's where the uncertainty comes here is that if we were to open a slot in the one grade for one, one slot in one grade and we have three students apply, um, we're not going to be able to decide which of those students are based on the application. It's going to be a lottery. And if that student then also has siblings, um, then we come back next year with the question of, well, you know, they have a kindergartner and they would like their kindergartner to come. And we're going to be back with that potential that we would need to consider. We don't have to open the space, but certainly given our past, um, given our past, uh, sort of way we've dealt with this, it would be something we would have to think about. Uh, and then of course, the other challenge that that could uh, pose for us is that our enrollment in the last, for the last couple of years has not been going down, it's been going up. And so, you know, we, we have still a couple of grades that have uh, smaller class sizes, uh, even for Dennett standards, um, but those are getting fewer and far between. You know, I think we've, we've made the comment if, if, if we had had a pandemic three or four years ago, we probably wouldn't have had any space issues in the Dennett at six feet. But we, we do because we have a couple grades that are big and we know that one more are coming. So does that help, Mike? Yeah, no, that, that, ans that answers my question on that. Because then we won't, because then we, we, we wouldn't know. It would, it, if it's going to be somebody that's not in our, in our district, then that would affect the Silver Lake. And I will clarify that, that, you know, if we were to open a single slot in a grade and a, uh, and a student got in there by lottery and had a sibling in a different grade, they would not be able to ask for school choice until the next year, because we will make the decision tonight about school choice for the next year that doesn't get affected if a student also has, you know, a first grader, that's a, uh, that's a sibling. So um, just uh, my, my comments, you know, um, uh, Mike, thanks for reaching out to us. Um, you know, I always tell my boys that, you know, when they agonize over doing something, it's like, well, if you ask and you get your answer and the answer is still no, you're no worse off than you were. So I, I thank you for stepping forward and doing that. I think it's a good productive discussion I actually think that this is probably the most we've discussed this at any school choice hearing absent the first one we did. Um, and so it's good to have that out there and good for folks to be able to understand what we're thinking about, the complexities of it. Um, Dan, thank you for your questions. This was your first time through this. Um, and so, you know, it's very, very, uh, very good that you, that you had the questions and was thinking through it. Um, I think it's always a it's always a, a, a tough choice to sort of think about this, particularly when we have a parent asking to do this. Um, I, I, I do th I do think that um, it's a little bit um, you know it is a little bit challenging to to try and figure out um, whether this makes sense at the time. Um, you know I think it's I think that is a grade that could accommodate it, but I guess. You know, I, I, I don't see quite the same issues that we had when we first did this. And each of the other school choice uh, votes where we allowed it was for siblings. Um, so that, that does, to me, that makes it a little bit challenging. Um, 
but I'll leave my comments there. Are there any other comments from the from the committee members or from the administration? Any thoughts? So uh, that being said, I think we need to um, figure out what to do here. Jill. Jill. Okay, Jill. I would just note that should you decide to withdraw from school choice that um, the resolution on which you vote to withdraw must contain the reasons for the withdrawal according to the regulations. So if you decide not to participate in school choice, you should cite the reasons for which you choose not to participate in school choice as part of that. And that's under General Law Chapter 76, 128, I think that's a D. <laughs> so much has happened in a year, I forgot about that part of it. 12 B D, sorry. <laughs> so I would make a motion that the Plimpton School Committee not enter the Dennett Elementary into school choice for the 2021-2022 school year because our class sizes are currently meeting school committee guidelines. And do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, do, we, do we have any additional discussion on the motion? Um, I'll say this. Be, I'll just say this before we vote. Um, yep. I I see the downside to it. It's crystal clear, um, and I I've been in uh, Plimpton now for nine years, just over nine years. I love the Dennett School. They are phenomenal. Um, the Silver Lake uh, District is phenomenal. Even though I haven't gotten to the later stages of it yet, because my oldest son's coming up on nine years old. Um, the plus side where Mike's uh, older child is already in the system and just out of sheer loyalty to the teachers in this uh, district that I hold near and dear. They're just phenomenal with my son for the years that he's been in the Dennett and the fact that Mike, and this probably shouldn't play into it, but just out of loyalty to the Silver Lake family and community, um, I just want people to take that into account. I understand that this is a lottery and Mike might open the door and somebody else squeaks in in front of him. That is possible. But um, I think it's certainly something to entertain in light of the, the request from the person that's putting it out there. That's where I stand. Thank you, Dan. Any other comments? Okay, we'll do a roll call. Uh, I'll start with you, Jason. Yes. Uh, Mike? Yes. Dan? That was a no, uh, and I am a yes. So uh, other Mike, um, I really do thank you for reaching out. Um, I'm actually quite honored that, that you did and that you feel so strongly about what we're doing at Dennett. Um, and that, you know, I, I, I am, I'm, um, so thank you. Thank you guys for your time. I was well aware of the circumstances and, and knew that it wasn't just a, a uh, you could take my child. So I knew I, I knew the ramifications of, of this meeting and, and, and what it would open up and that it would be a, a lottery. So I knew I knew going in what it you know what it would entail. So again, thank you very much for your time and I wish you guys the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, and then procedurally, do we need to vote to close? I make a motion to close the public hearing on school choice. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, uh, roll call, Jason? Yes. Mike? Yes. Dan? Yes. And John is a yes. Okay, thank you everyone. All right, diving into the regular agenda, we have uh, minutes from March 12th and March 22nd. Did folks make have a, a take a look? I'm sorry. I make a motion to approve the minutes from our March 12th 
and March 22nd regular meetings. I will second. I will second that. Okay. Again, roll call. Jason? Yes. Dan? Yes. Mike? Yes. And John is a yes. Okay. I don't, um, I didn't receive any correspondence since our last meeting and looks like Jill says nothing has come to the central office either. Uh, on negotiations, um, we will be discussing that during uh, executive session following uh, this regular meeting. Uh, and that's both with respect to um, discussions with the teachers as well as the aides. Uh, new business. Okay, uh, Dennett Fields and Use by Dogs. Uh, unfortunately, Amy wasn't able to be here. This is something that Amy had brought up to the town. Um, apparently, we are having issues with um, dogs using the fields, not just at the Dennett, but also here in the center of town at, at the Holt Field. But our focus is on the Dennett, using the Dennett soccer fields as a, as a place to um, take care of business, shall we say. Um, and uh, Amy in her role uh, with Pays um, has asked both the town and because we oversee the fields, um, asked us to consider signage uh, for the Dennett fields uh, to prohibit dogs from utilizing it. Um, it, it uh, apparently they're having quite significant issues with having to go and check the fields before each of the soccer games um, and clean up um, any messes that are there. And it's, I think generally, not, not only is that not really what folks should have to do, folks should clean up, but I think it's also probably kind of unhygienic, even if you are picking up the waste. Um, so uh, I just toss it out there, see if folks have some additional thoughts on that. <clears throat> so I think- John? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so just to just to um, echo on that, um, my wife was up there uh, a few days back walking when the weather was nice, um, and um, she did bring that to my attention that that there was quite a bit of um, of that going on. So uh, we definitely uh, would have to we definitely got to do something about it. Uh, people are not people are not picking up after their pets. Yeah, uh, Jessica Kinsman, did you have a comment too? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, as a resident, my family and I have utilized the fields at Dennett for years. Um, the whole time that we've lived here, we've had dogs and we've always walked them at Dennett and always picked up after them. Um, unfortunately, not everybody does. I will tell you that last spring when the schools were closed, my husband went to Dennett weekly and picked up the trash, which was mostly from dogs. And he brought it to the dump and he replaced the bags and he did that the entire time Dennett was closed until it reopened. I can tell you that there haven't been any bags at Dennett available for people to use since probably last April or so. And I think that that has had a huge impact in people not picking up after their pets. Unfortunately, not everybody has a bag or thinks to bring one. Um, but living in a community where there's limited places to go let a dog just run freely. And since the community doesn't have a leash law, um, I would advocate for maybe finding a way of enforcing it or communicating to people, not just at Dennett, because a lot of residents take their dogs there, um, mm -hmm. that it's a problem that needs to be addressed. But I would strongly ask that people not be penalized um, for the actions of others. So thank you. Okay. So interestingly, after this came to my attention, I did, uh, brought my son down to basketball league practice that he was doing. And um, as I pulled in the driveway of, the, of that school, right at the, at the entrance, they actually don't, they prohibit all pets from being anywhere on the property. Um, I think that's a little extreme there. Um, and as I've been looking around a little more, I'm seeing a more aware, because I wasn't paying any attention to it, but I'm more aware of, of um, uh, that it's pretty regular for you to either to um, not let the dogs on the property or at least to ask to to keep them off the fields. You know, there are other parts there. I mean, and, and, and if you're keeping them off the fields and they clearly need to, 
to understand that they're supposed to take everything out that comes in. Um, so, you know, I mean, so there's kind of a couple ways we could deal with data fields. One is, I mean, we can't, I don't think doing nothing is an, is an option here, but I think we either have a requirement that, that people need to clean up after themselves, or we look to restrict use of the fields uh, from pets. John, if you, if you wouldn't mind, I get some yep. help. Um, you know, having to tell, I mean, I don't have a dog currently, but I've had uh, dogs throughout my life. And um, Jessica, I, I, I apologize. This is going to fly in the face of your position, but um, I have never walked my dog and not brought a bag with me because I was expecting the school to have bags on the premises. So when my dog goes to the bathroom on the soccer field or on the baseball field, I could go get a bag supplied from the school to pick up my dog's waste. Um, there's just a socially social responsibility when you're a pet owner, a uh, dog owner specifically. And the fact, I, I think having to put up a sign to remind people that own a dog that choose to walk it on a soccer field, asking them or reminding them that they need to pick up the fecal matter is as ridiculous as McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts having to write caution contents are hot, which I know is as a result of a lawsuit somewhere. Um, but if you own a dog and you don't know enough that you can't let your dog defecate on a soccer field in a school, then one, you probably shouldn't have a dog. And two, you certainly shouldn't be walking around the school. So I think a, a patronizing sign reminding people to pick up their dog matter is absurd. I have two sons that play soccer. My older son plays baseball as well. And although he hasn't stepped fallen or slipped in in any any dog matter but uh i know i'm not going to be happy when it happens and so i don't know it's not like i'm really hot on this topic because this is the first i'm hearing about it but um i do think it's ridiculous to put up a sign to remind people that they have to pick up their dog's droppings and i would be i would be more inclined to say that dogs shouldn't be on a kid's soccer field in a school playground we have walking trails around the town. There's plenty of places where you can walk your dog that doesn't have to be on a soccer field in a school. Um, I know it's convenient, it's easy, it's, in, it's a closed in area and it's, it's great to let your dog run free, you know, but um, there, you know, I don't know what the average size lot is in Plimpton, but um, people have yards. Um, there's plenty of walking trails. There's a lot of places in town that dogs can be walked. It doesn't need to be a soccer field. And if I didn't have children playing on that field, I'd, I'd feel the same way as a dog owner for probably the better part of my life. So, sorry. Jason? I just want to take a minute to clarify that I stated that we do pick up after our pet. Oh, no, 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 I know. a lot of time picking up after other pets. And I just question why we have bags there that don't get refilled. And I don't know if that's the school or if it's Parks and Rec or if it's Pays, but I think I think we might wanna just start with the simple fix of, I mean, yes, I agree with you. People should be bringing bags to pick up after the, their pets. And I can tell you that once those bags ran out, we started to see a huge increase in people not picking up after them, which is unfortunate because it's the responsible owners that will pay the price. Yeah, you know, by all means, can I just say this? I, I applaud your husband's efforts with the trash and the bags and stuff like that. And, and you know, he is, he is a, a shining example of the majority of Plimpton residents. Um, this is just a great town to live in. And your, your husband's not unique in that sense with, uh, what do we call ourselves, Plimptonites? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but um, no, what your husband did all through the pandemic is great. You know, and if there were more people that did what he did, this wouldn't even have to be discussed today. You know, we wouldn't have to put that contents is hot label on this, like McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts. But um, there are a lot of people that that don't aren't, aren't as generous with their time and effort as your husband. And unfortunately, you know, this, in my opinion, that, you know, people that do the right thing are far outweighed by the people that aren't. And unfortunately, I think this is one of the situations. Go ahead, Jason. So Dan, to echo what you were saying, 
this this is also the first time I've heard um, of this being the problem at the level it's at. So I would hesitate to go full measure on this and, and, and say right now we want to say no dogs up at the fields. I would like to see if we could take an incremental approach and see if we can somehow dissuade what's been happening, but still allow responsible citizens of the town um, to have access to walk around the fields, not necessarily on them, um, and around the school grounds. Um, I don't know. I don't know exactly how we accomplish that, but again, like you said, Dan, this this is the first time I'm hearing of it at this level um, of an issue. So to clarify, the, the bags are not there as a result of the school or the town. My understanding is those bags are provided by PACE um, because I know that as a school, school committee, we've never approved the purchase of them or anything like that. Um, I don't believe there, is there any signage up at the fields right now where the bags are? Or they're just, there are. So we already have signage saying, please pick up after your dogs. Yeah. So. John, a little bit of history there. That, that was, this was a big issue probably about 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago. Yeah. We put the signs up and things got better for a while. Um, the problem came up again, so we installed a couple of those stations. Um, okay. So we, we've we been trying to handle it as best we can. So, so we, from the school perspective, installed the stations? Correct. Okay. And then, of course, the, the issue appears to have... have Another thing, another, another uh, great benefit of COVID, I guess, because we weren't there and therefore things weren't getting filled and bad behavior ran, ran amok and now we're back here. So, I mean, Jason, I agree with an incremental approach, but I'm not sure what that is if we already have signs, bigger signs. <laughs> I mean, not to be flip about it, but it's like, if we already have signs we have the stations. Are we filling the? Are we filling those with bags now, or can we check on that? I I put the initial ones out there, but it, I haven't done anything with it since. Okay. What if if the soccer field seems to be the problem? What if we could change the signage to keep the dogs off the soccer field specifically? I mean, because there's plenty of other grassy areas of the entire school grounds that would be less of a problem. But soccer, I mean, every inch of that field is used constantly by every age group every weekend and all during the school day recesses and the nine yards. You know, what if we could just maybe put the signage to keep them off the soccer field? That, know, was, that was my thought. Um, and then we, we're kind of mitigating the damage to the, to the people. I assume that this is Mr. Kinsman. Um, that just sat down. Uh, people like him that are doing the right thing and going above and beyond, we're not taking away everything that's a convenience in in uh, his travels with the dog. Right. No, I mean, I, that was my initial thought. I wasn't quite in favor of this, you know, where the, I mean, I understand why that school that I was talking about had it up at the entrance, but I didn't think that seemed a little, little heavy handed for <clears throat> Plumpton. And I know there are other schools that, that, that do that as well. Um, but that was going to be my thought of, well, you know, you can, for about $25 a sign off of Amazon, you can pick up signs to say, you know, dogs not permitted on the field. Um, and then, you know, if someone wants to walk their dog around the track, they're not going to be running free though, unless they're really well-trained and they stay with you. Um, and there's other big grassy areas up there. We have the area out in front of the school, um, you know, that we could, we could at least in that way be incremental. Jason, just trying to meet your thoughts. I'm not sure that we, if, if we just refill the bags that that's an incremental approach that seems to be where we are other than the fact that there aren't bags. Right, no, and, and that's not necessarily what I was saying. I mean, yeah. I think us brainstorming here, I, I do agree, Dan, that there should never be pets on the soccer fields or on the softball fields. None of the playing surfaces should ever have pets on them. But like you're saying, there are some of those boundary areas and some some green areas up there that that we could possibly still give a shot for. And I have seen signage, John, at several different school districts in the area that specifically do mention the playing surfaces, the playing fields, to keep the pets off. Um, 
And you're right, it's absolutely not good enough just to pick it up afterwards because it does leave back behind bacterial yeah. contamination for a period of time. Yeah, so that just seems like it'd be the, the, the middle ground from one, one extreme to the other. Let, so, the parents, uh, let the parents step in it on the sideline, that's okay. Yeah, Art, did you want to speak? Yeah, um, no, I, I appreciate the incremental approach and, um, you know, I mean, I, tonight I, I, I went up, I picked my dog poop behind the bench and, uh, you know, on the uh, far end of the field and I picked it up and then I noticed there was another one sitting there that there was, you know, somebody else had left. So, I mean, clearly there's an issue. Um, I, I'm not going to, I know Jess already kind of gave you the, the scoop on what, what went on. I do think the lack of bags, even though I do bring one myself and I know some people do, um, I think that that creates an, an issue. Um, I, I, you know, I, like, like I said, I, it's, I'm not sure where the committee's going on this, but um, I would appreciate an incremental approach because I also, you know, I picked up a lot of trash left by kids and water bottles, things, you know, and obviously they're sports fields. And, um, but I see, I, I see a tremendous amount of trash, um, a lot of masks left on the field, um, you know, after games, things like that. Um, and then finally, I, I, I guess, um, you know, I could see where during, you know, soccer season, we probably don't want to have pets on the field um, during baseball season. We don't want to have pets on the, on the, um, on the diamond. Um, I don't really see where it should be, you know, during the summertime and in July, um, you know, if a guy wants to take his, you know, I see, I, I have a couple neighbors, they take their dogs down there and they throw a ball and the dog fetches it and they pick up after themselves. I, I don't see that as being too unsanitary, but, um, you know, maybe during certain seasons, you'd want to keep them off the playing surface, you know, would, would make a lot of sense. That's just my thought. Um, but I, you know, I guess I would say if there's going to be signage too, I do encourage more signage about the dog situation, but um, also a little more signage or maybe public awareness about the, the trash left around, the, the masks, the bottles, the other mm -hmm. items that are, you know, pretty consistently left there. Okay. So how about this? Um, if the committee is, if the committee is good with it, um, I'm happy to uh, reach out and, and talk to Pays about the issues that they are having um, and to work with um, Peter and figure out what sort of incremental approach we can take here. Um, you know, this is part of the, part of, part of what works in Plimpton is when people do everything they're supposed to do and we have great freedoms to not always have our dog on a leash and so on. Um, and so maybe we can find out a, a way to deal with this that, that works best. Um, it likely will be a little more complicated than just putting up signs saying no dogs, but maybe that's the way to try and do it. Maybe some field rules uh, and replenish the bags and maybe even a temporary notice up to remind people that, you know, if you, if you, can, if you can't pick up after yourselves, then additional restrictions will have to go in place. I would almost think that uh, Amy, with her uh, position with Pays, I would think that she she could probably blast out a message to all the parents, which would get to the root of the children and maybe some parents that are actually leaving the the trash. Um, yeah. Just make make them a little more aware, and that's probably something she could handle in in a matter of minutes with a with a group email. Yeah, so I, I, side I, of it, I think is simple. That's what I. That's what my hope is: is that we can kind of address sort of the multifaceted issues here, um, without being too stringent. Um, but clearly, we need to do something more than what we've been doing, and we can even put something up. I can work with, um, uh, you know, I can work with uh, town administrator, and maybe we can send out a message via Facebook from the town's account about what the expectation is with fields. Um, and we can and we can go from there. I also have to connect with them and understand what the what the selectmen have decided to do with respect to the whole field. 
um, we probably should have some consistency with, with what we're doing from a town perspective with respect to that. So if committee members are okay with that, I'll take that as a takeaway uh, and we can, we can talk again about it in June and with the goal of trying to mitigate this and make sure that uh, all of the folks that are picking up up there only have to pick up their stuff. Novel thought. <laughs> okay. Um, Jason, do we have any uh, DESE COVID-19 updates that you wanted to touch on? I just wanted to update the committee um, that the commissioner um, in conjunction with the Department of Health put out regulations redefining close contacts within classrooms specifically when all parties are wearing masks. Um, close contacts are now defined as three feet, less than three feet for 15 minutes of incremental time per day. Um, that rule does not apply to the lunchroom or to buses or any other situation where students are not wearing their masks. Um, but this redefinition um, will dramatically cut down on the amount of close contacts being reported by schools across the Commonwealth. And, and thus quarantines. Correct. Of students and, and teachers. Yeah. Yes, the Friday before vacation, Massachusetts schools had over 10,000 students in quarantine because of close contacts. So then we change the rules? Yep. Well, um, I'm hoping and, and um, I'm, I'm believing that there is evidence uh, to support this since the Department of Public Health supported uh, DESE's change of the requirement for close contacts. But we shall see, and we're in a lucky position at the Dennett, that we still have the six feet of distance in our classrooms. Smaller net catches less fish. Okay, thank you for the update. Um, on to unfinished business, uh, building-based substitute. Anything to update there, Peter? No, no news, sorry. Okay, and then uh, playground, can we get an update as to where we are with that? Good evening. Uh, last month's meeting, an interesting question was brought up when somebody asked about, you mentioned the septic system and how that is in relationship to the new playground. So I said, you know, I can't let this pass. I have to, I have to ask more questions. <laughs> so I started seeking out information and found that I, what I do is I call the company that actually takes care of the annual maintenance of the system that comes out and pumps it. And I ask them if they ever had any issues, if they've noticed any issues, because my experience has been, unless it's failing, that's how I found out that there was a problem was um, they could tell things weren't operating properly. Well, it seemed to, they've said they have never had any issues with that. So there wasn't a concern there, but they did stress a concern how they have to access the, um, the D box and how they have to actually pump the tank. So he asked if we could, you know, if we were redoing that whole area, could we kind of take this into consideration? So the area that they're concerned with is closer to the building and it does not impact where the new playground is gonna be. But I've asked them that um, during this time, if they could just come out and take we'll give them a can of spray paint. Like, where is that area that's creating the obstacle for you? Because they said, they're usually able to take care of what they need to take care of, but sometimes it's a real struggle because they have to go under the walkway and they try not to disrupt it. So they're trying to sneak underneath to get to where they have to go. So they're gonna to try to do that in the intro before they start breaking ground. So that when we are doing all that work, maybe we could modify that area so that it does provide ease of access um, because if there ever was a failing of the system, they'd have to disrupt the whole area. Then now to the bid piece. Um, um, Christine, before you go into that, I have some additional information to add as well. Oh, okay. So I had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Durkee up at the Dennett um, and talk about that issue specifically of if hypothetically we had to replace the system and if hypothetically we have the playground to the immediate right of the existing leaching field, do we have enough room in his opinion to be able to put in a new leaching field? And his, his opinion was that with mo the movement of the playground to the right of that system, it leaves us from the D box to the left, a fair amount of space where we would be able to put in uh, a, a different leaching field. You might have to take a few trees and things like that over towards the, the, you know, the basketball court. And we may have to you know, move some things around, but that he didn't, he was not concerned 
that our placement would would you know that that the only place to put it were, would be where we're putting the playground in fact right. felt, they felt actually i asked that of the design firm also to see and they felt that there was adequate adequate space if we did have a failure and we had to move put in a new leaching field we would be we would have plenty of space for that so i just need once that came up last week last meeting i just needed to make sure that it was i didn't I didn't want it to have any more life. I wanted to kind of resolve that it was a non-issue, that it wasn't going to impede our progress. Exactly. Now on to the bid. Um, the bid information has already been gathered together for the actual placement and installation of the playground. Um, this Thursday is the due date for the state's goods and services bulletin, which is run by the operational services division. So that once it reaches that, it goes out to the public after that. So it's accessible to anybody that's looking for these types of contracts. And it needs to be published in the goods and services bulletin because the dollar value was over $100,000 in the total of the whole project. Uh, so the information is due on Thursday. It'll be published. The book is only published every other week. So it's going to be a next Wednesday's bulletin that's published. So that's the update of where we are right now on the playground. And the progress has been not speedy, but there's been progress. Excellent. And that's it for right now. Jason, did you have a comment? Absolutely, Christine, thank you for double checking on the septic. Um, as I mentioned at the last meeting and, and, and John took it to heart as well. That was one of my major concerns about us putting down, you know, this, this long term investment and then realizing a couple years into it that we mm -hmm. might have to dig it back up. So thank you for alleviating my concerns and fears about that. And uh, it's amazing to hear that it's going to be going out to bid. Um, those are words I've been waiting to hear for a while. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, I was looking over the blueprints as I tend to do from time to time uh, of the most recent update. And it does include all of the items we added um, when we had parent participation asking us to make it ADA plus compliant. Um, we added the we go round, we added the sway fund. Um, but one of the things I noticed on the diagram that Peter and I um, had kind of asked for was a ramp onto part of the actual play structure. Um, it still looks like it might be what's called a transfer, which under ADA is permissible. But again, it's not as accessible to students who might have some major mobi mobility issues. Um, so before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we might want to put a change order in to have a ramp attached instead of a transfer. Um, right. So you're saying it's the ramp onto the play structure and yeah. maybe a transfer, but that's not what you'd prefer. Right. Um, you know, it's not going to give um, all students all access. I, I know this is not a fully integrated playground um, like Kingston has for their integrated pre-K. Um, but we did talk about trying to get, um, you know, some access point for kids with mobility issues to independently be able to get onto the play structure, at least part of it. Um, and we had asked for a ramp to be added in. And I noticed in the most recent blueprint I've seen, there's no ramp there. It's still a transfer. Um, right. Can I ask you to do me a favor? Could you just print off the page you're looking at and kind of circle and put a note there? And I what I'll do is I'll, I'll reach out to them tomorrow morning, but if you can get that to me, I can at least give them a visual of exactly what it is that um, may be missing from the current plan. Great. And I mean, I know we're also, um, you know, going to try and look at the contingency funds when we get towards the end of the project to add more rubberized surface. And that would give more accessibility as well to uh, ground level um, interactive portions of the playground for kids with mobility issues too so it's going to be um, one alternate and the alternate will include that additional rubberized service service right. great so i mean the ramp um you know this is the last piece of the pie i think that will really bring the playground to where we want it to be um, but if there's some design reason potentially why it wasn't put in um i just sure. like to have that conversation yeah. um but not slow down putting it out to bit at this point I'll follow up on that. And I will get you that information, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, do you have those blueprints digitally? I do. Any chance you could share them with me? Absolutely. They're public documents, so no problem sending them to you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, the solar project, uh, just a couple of small updates there. Um, 
uh, one, we do have a uh, article on the town meeting warrant to uh, allow the town to enter into a pilot agreement with the solar company. So that will that's one of the things we need to have in place. Uh, additionally, the application that's been going through the state process um, continues to move along. Um, in fact, I think it's most of the way through that. And then the third piece of that, and we'll talk about that a bit when we get to, to budgets, um, is uh, we have a bunch of big pine trees back behind the school. Um, and so when I was meeting with Mr. Durkee, we talked through that. Uh, and he very quickly got us uh, a bid to take down 15 trees back there. Uh, and that is on the special town meeting uh, warrant uh, so that we will be able to get those removed. And I view that as a double purpose, uh, double purpose article. Uh, the trees really should come down anyways um, because they are almost all of them are within striking distance of the building. Uh, some of them are very close. And if one of those falls in that roof, uh, we will end up with a new roof on there. And that is not the part of the school that we need to put a new roof on. Um, and it will do a lot of damage given it's a metal roof. So this is a really a proactive approach. The other piece to that, that that's, that's good is that there are a lot of other trees in that space. So my guess is, is once we remove those, we're not gonna miss them. Um, it's not like we're clearing an area. So it, it's gonna be much better for the school building and then it also opens up the solar panels to be able to gather uh, sort of the primary, the prime um, amount of sunshine, particularly in the winter, which is where they would have blocked it for a good chunk of the day. So that will allow us uh, a lower um, electricity rate for the power that we'll be buying that's generated by the solar panels. Um, and will give us some cost savings on, on the cost of electricity that we have even over what Christine is able to uh, negotiate for us on an annual basis, and we are significantly cheaper than, than I would have expected. So, you know, thank you, Christine, for all the work on that over the years, but this will be an option for us to be able to get even more savings off of it. So that's, that's moving along. Um, the trees will uh, likely come down some point between May 12th and, and the end of June because that's when the money will need to be spent since it's part of the special town meeting in this annual, the, the money from our budget. John, can I ask a question about the tree? This may be a trivial question and I fell prey to this because I thought we had a clear understanding with my tree guy um, when he took down 10, like 70 foot pines in my backyard um, and he didn't take them down and remove them. He cut them in Put and let them fall into the tree line behind it, creating giant holes in my tree line. Uh, I just want to make sure that this this bid is not for the same thing. Well, my understanding is is they're going to have to lift them out. I, I don't see how you could cut these without a crane, especially for the ones close to the building. Um, well, I, 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 yeah. I, I had a pine grove in the front of my house, and they took down a ton of trees so I could put in a like eighteen thousand square foot lawn. And they, they stumped everything, they took everything out, loaded it on trucks and, and everything went. And I said, you know, I want these 10 trees, I think it was 10 or 11 trees that are like 30 feet over the entire tree line, but they're not, they're staggered. So it, they look ridiculous. And yeah. some of them came out beyond the tree line. So anyway, I said, I'd like to do the same thing with these trees that we did in the front and get rid of them. And I thought I implied that I wanted them stumped and removed. Right. And I was at work and they come in and they cut all 10 or 11 of them from the back and push them into the tree line, which made 10 giant holes in the tree line. Yeah. I, and needless to say, I wasn't too happy with the, the end result. So I don't think they'll be stumping any of these, but my understanding is, is this was to, to, uh, to cut and remove. Uh, I can follow up with Matt on that. Uh, happy to do it, but I, I don't, I don't see how they could do that given where the, most of these trees are within easy striking distance of the building. Yeah, I think they're going to come in there with equipment and a crane and cut and lift and put it on a log truck and take it out. Um, it just there's I mean, there's there's a couple that are probably 50 60 feet tall and they're 25 feet off the building. Yeah, like I say, the mine, they just cut them on the backside and use the uh, the bobcat to push them away from my house into the tree line they will not be able to get any equipment like that into where these trees are. It's down in a gully. 
And okay. so they're going to have to, they're going to have to lift, but I will double check just to make sure, cause we don't want that because the rest of the, the rest of the woods there is actually quite pretty. Yeah. So. Come by my house. If you want to see what it's going to look like, if they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I trust you, man. <laughs> okay. Um, the annual report, uh, all the committee members know that that was sorted and sent in. Um, Judy, I will send you a copy of it and we can include it with the minutes for this meeting. Um, just so that we have it as part of the as part of the minutes as well. It will be in the in the in the annual report that will be available from the town a little later, like in early May. And uh, and thanks folks for reviewing that. Um, and this is the school committee protocols. To me, this is this is like the power lines. It keeps showing up, and I'm usually exhausted by the time we get to it. Um, and trying to remember what we decided last time. Uh, <laughs> You're going to have to help me, Jill. Okay. So last time we asked the committee to review the policy manual that spoke specifically to um, school committee protocols, powers, those kinds of things, um, section B in the policy manual, and to review that in comparison to um, the possibility of creating our own protocols or following the MASC protocols. And we first wanted to determine whether or not it was necessary given the, the policies that we already had in place. So we asked them to review the policies and to consider whether or not they, um, one, felt that there were any changes that needed to be made to our current policies, which would need to go to the policy subcommittee, or if they wanted to visit the idea of creating uh, protocols similar to what MASC has, or even adopting the MASC protocols uh, that were provided to us when we had the um, the MASC presentation. It seems like years ago, but it was only months ago. <laughs> so um, we've had a lot to to work on since then. But I that's how all of this how, that's how this discussion came to be. Right. So I, I know I did dutifully pull that up. After our last meeting, I got about three quarters of the way through it, and then I haven't looked at it since. So that's that's my that's my admission of guilt here. Um, I, I will say that I felt there were a number of spots that we would, at a minimum, need to revisit. As far as um, I I read some things in our policy that I'm like I don't think that's how we handle it. So um, I know I know that in my time on the committee we have not reviewed that policy. So it's it's old. Uh, Jason, I don't know, did you have an opportunity to look at any of that or do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I had some of the similar feelings to what you had. Um, I, I think it's definitely something, Jill, that from, from my perspective, we should probably have a deeper conversation at the policy, policy subcommittee meeting and then we can report back out to the larger committees. We can do a deeper dive. So not every single member has to do that and go through it line by line. And it might take um, a year. It might take all next year to do it. And we just do a little chunk at a time. And, um, you know, by the end of the year, maybe we'll be able to report out of, of how we want to adjust practice to actually reflect what we do here and what all of our school committees in the union do as well. Okay. Yeah. So I, I did read enough to, to feel like we need to do work. So we, I answered that part of the question, you know, it just, it just, I'm, I'm just going, yeah, this, well, it feels like to me, like when I'm, you know, in my day job reading something going, when was this last looked at? So I, th I think it's, it's time for an update. I do like the idea of using the policy subcommittee where we sort of have to focus on it and, and dig through it. Um, so I, I think that's largely the answer we were hoping to get that we didn't want to make the decision without having some review at the, at the higher, at the full school committee level. Um, but I think it would be easier for members, to your point, Jason, to react to suggestions rather than trying to come up with them on their own. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to standing committees, uh, admin review. I know we've had, I think there had been some meetings on that. Mike, would did you attend? So my understanding of where we are is that there, there's been uh, some meetings to discuss. We have the annual evaluation. 
for the superintendent. And so right. that's been the most of the work there. Mike? Sorry, yeah, I was on mute, sorry. All right. Yeah, the same thing. We 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 were reviewing the, the superintendent's uh entry plan and for everybody to um to participate with that. Um we also um voted the Shia cost contracts. There was um there was three contracts that we had mentioned during our last meeting, so they were all um voted in and approved. Um and there, there wasn't too much else. I think it was just those three items, but if there was more, I just, I apologize. And I think there was just those three. Yeah. And that's both admin review and union 31. So that's being efficient. I right. It was a, yeah, it was a, it was a joint meeting. Right. So, okay. Um, so negotiations, we already, uh, Jason, go ahead. Just to reiterate that the evaluations for the superintendent are due this Friday. Um, so please everybody take a moment and do a review. Uh, to give Jill some feedback on her incredible year. <laughs> now, what a freshman year, huh? All right. Um, Dan, do you have any update on PAC? Um, I was only able to make the first half of the last meeting because I was at work that night. Um, and I don't have a report for anything from that first half of the meeting. I apologize. Okay. Uh, policy, I don't, we have not had a policy meeting since our last meeting where we approved the policies that last came out of the policy committee. Uh, nothing on capital improvement. Um, and, cause, and, and there is, but I'm going to hold it when we talk about the budget. Um, that's where I'm going to talk about the, we'll go through the various items that we're putting on the special town meeting warrant. Uh, so Jason, and that would bring it back to you for legislative. And while you do that, I'm going to get some water. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with some information from the federal end, um, just looking at some of the topics that Ryan's going to talk about later um, tonight. Um, Title II and Title IV-A have been funded this year um, at a higher level than we've seen historically in the past. Um, we've also seen IDEA um, raised up to $15.5 billion for this fiscal year. Um, that's still far below um, what IDEA had set out to do when it was originally established. Again, IDEA is supposed to help pay for the extraordinary cost of educating students with special needs. Um, currently, uh, the federal government is only living up to 15% of its obligation where by statute, it's supposed to be recognizing 40% of that cost um, to educate students with significant disabilities. So we still have a long way to go. Um, I am working with Congressman Keating on a bill called the IDEA Full Funding Act, which would slowly over seven years bring the federal government up to that 40% level for funding our students with special needs. Um, I'm also continuing to press on the fact that our Title I funding continues to go down in Plimpton. Um, in FY20, we only had $20,000 uh, of Title I funds in district, and that's down from $35,000 in FY17. Uh, so you can see that it's almost been cut in half in just four years. On the state front, something a little strange happened. Um, the Senate and House Ways and Means Committee came together. Um, usually the Senate doesn't weigh in on the state budget until after the House has fully ratified its version. Um, they funded Chapter 70 at $5.5 billion this year, which is the highest level Chapter 70 has ever been funded at. That includes one-sixth funding for the Student Opportunity Act. We had been asking for two-sevenths, um, but they are planning on fulfilling the Student Opportunity Act at its original date of completion, which is now six years from now. Um, they did include reimbursement for a circuit breaker for special ed transportation um, in this year's bill. And they also fenced off $40 million for enrollment fluctuations. Um, we had been advocating for schools being allowed to use either their September 1, 2020 um, enrollment or their September 1, 2019 enrollment, whichever was larger. Um, statewide, we saw a 3% decline in public school enrollment um, last year 
And uh, enrollment is one of the key factors in determining Chapter 7, 70 funding. Um, this fenced off fund uh, would not be enough to cover our schools if all 3% of those students came back to public education next year. Um, we still have time to work with our, uh, our friends and allies in the Senate. Uh, and then this will obviously go to the conference committee to uh, have some reconciliation before a final vote. So there's still time uh, to work with our partners up at the state house to get uh, the adequate funding for our public schools that we need, especially knowing um, that we're gonna have additional student needs next year. Uh, some good news, um, Rep Lenatra has co-sponsored uh, a statewide um, study um, that is now Bill H663. Um, and this statewide study, if passed, um, would establish a special committee to study student sleep needs and start times for our schools. Um, it has gained eight co-signatories in the House and Senate at this point, and it has been referred to the Joint Committee on Education, um, which means that bill has life and a chance um, to potentially be voted on this year. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, Jason. Christine, signal signature warrants. Today, nine warrants were totaling $87,631.78 were forwarded to the superintendent and Chair John Williamson for electronic signature. And I had to tell you that you two are very, very speedy. I don't think they were gone all that long before I had them back. So thank you very much. They're going to be at the town hall tomorrow morning. So thank you very much. Every so often, but don't depend on it. <laughs> well, at past few times, it has worked out quite well. So I thank you for being so attentive, both of you. Absolutely. Uh, we have not had a meeting down at Health and Safety uh, Committee, so nothing to report there. Um, Amy wasn't able to make it tonight, so we don't have a specific update in CASA, though I would note that they have been very, very active as of late um, with masks, the availability of masks, which uh, Jason, I know you got one of them and like it very much and, um, and uh, lots of different events and, uh, and things like that. So, you know, it's great to be able to see that, especially given that things aren't quite back to normal yet. So, Jason? Yeah, um, the fundraiser they did with the put a ticket in to win a basket, um, that got the kids all jazzed up all around town because they did a live stream of it as well. So when they were picking it out, they, you could hear it from around town, just the cheers, and the oohs and the ahs going on in the rooms. And um, they also did a flower sale recently as well, beautiful flowers, um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, Casa has been rising uh, to meet a lot of needs for just some happiness and some things to look forward to. So appreciate all their efforts. Mr. Benito. Hi, John, thank you. So I'll give you folks a school and staff update. Um, before I dive into that too much, I wanna take a second to thank the staff at Dennett. I had to quarantine myself for much longer than I wanted to. And um, trying to run the building from home is, is challenging and people really stepped up and uh, did some things that were out of their comfort zone. So I wanna thank them, um, and especially Judy, because I called her about 12 times every day and uh, she still was accepting my call, so I'm thankful. So thanks to the staff. Um, getting to some school-oriented business, right now our current enrollment is at 220 students. Um, I think it's just about this time every year, John, that we start to look at kindergarten numbers, and we're, we're sitting at 39 right now. Um, we've received packets from 32 families. I believe Mrs. Hansen reached out to the seven that we were looking for, and um, I think 39 is a good number. I'd like it to not increase too much. Hi, Jason. Um, can we just do some back of the napkin math of what our total student population could be next fall? What is our current sixth grade? 19. 19. So it would be plus 20. Correct. So we'd be potentially at 240. That is correct. Okay. So on my time in the committee, We've been as low as 201. We were very close to the 199 at one point. So 220 is a 10% increase in the lowest population I've ever seen 
uh, and we're adding 20 more to that. So again, I, I, I understand what we did earlier with the school choice, but um, another reason why we need to be very careful with these decision-making um, processes we go through, that is the largest number of students in my entire time on the school committee that Dennett has ever housed. Uh, Peter, have you ever had more kids in the Dennett in your time as principal? Uh, the year I started was 245. So we're, we're approaching the highest it's been in 12, 13 years. And I think, you know, the, the other challenge is, of course, we're sitting here in end of April. We haven't had the summer sales time for houses. That said, inventory is really tight. So that, that may help to mitigate that potential. Um, but it is, it's just something we have to keep in mind that just because we have numbers in April doesn't mean they don't change by September. So that's, right. a, that's, a, that's, a, high, that's, that's a high number for the kindergarten classes. It's been trending up with the last few years, absolutely. Um, something that probably nobody wants to talk about, but I have to bring it up anyway, is MCAS. Um, we do have some dates and times. We sent this information out to families on Parent Square on April 13th. Uh, but I figure I should mention it to you folks anyway. Um, the one good thing about MCAS this year is that they've kind of compacted everything. So it's only going to take us nine school days to test four different grade levels. Um, so we're not doing any testing on Mondays. Our first test is going to be May 18th, grade five ELA, the 19th, grade six ELA, the 20th, grade four ELA, Friday, the 21st, grade three ELA. Again, the following week, we're not doing anything on Monday. It's going to be all math starting with grade five on the 25th, grade six on the 26th, grade four on the 27th, grade three on the 28th. And then our poor fifth graders get stuck with a third session or third subject rather, they have science. And that looks like June one. And the, uh, the way that they're breaking it down this year, the state is suggesting, well, they always do, but they're not always entirely accurate, uh, approximately how much time each test should take they're proposing that the uh, ELA test should be between two and two and a half hours long. Math, they're anticipating about an hour and a half. And the science tech ed test, they said between one and a quarter and one and a half hours for students to be able to, to finish the test. So they've definitely compacted it down, which we appreciate. This is the second set of dates we've gotten from them. And I believe we spoke last month about whether or not even this, this plan is going to go through. And again, that, that information was sent home on the 13th. It's also on our website. Okay. Any update from staffing? Or are we uh, all... Nothing new, no. Okay, great. Any questions for Peter? Jason? So Peter, um, I know when we were in a hybrid model, um, that we were starting to talk about how we were going to address any issues we saw academically or social emotionally when the students started coming back. And I know in, in you know, terms of things, they've just started coming back. You're just starting to reestablish some routines. It's almost like the beginning of the year all over again. Um, can you speak to, you know, just some of the things you saw in the school and some of the things that the staff are doing to help these kids you know, get back into that rhythm and routine of uh, almost normal school. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the kids have adjusted very, very well. And as you mentioned, Jason, it, it was like the, it was like September 1st all over again. And it was in, in April. Um, one of the things that I've seen, which I think has been incredibly effective is the, the staff has done a nice job um, administering the second step program. Um, we spent a lot of time talking as a staff about when these kids do come back, this is going to be a huge shift. They're going to be tired. They're going to be potentially cranky. Um, and to a certain degree they have been, and that's understandable. Um, but the, the social and emotional component that, that, that we as a staff said, look, this is almost more important right now. Like we need to get the kids back in. We need them feeling good. We need them socializing. Um, Staff has done an awesome job about getting kids outside for mask breaks, giving them a chance to have some social interaction. And, and honestly, uh, they've responded very, very well. But the staff has done a great job. And I know some people are still. Okay. Peter, we 
lost your volume. Why don't you try and mute and unmute? Can you hear me? Yes, there we go. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe I'll shorten my response. That's uh, maybe that's the signal there. They've done staff has done an outstanding job with the social and emotional component. I, I couldn't be prouder. And I just want to add some of the information I've heard from Desi about the MCAS. Um, is that they are gonna try and unembargo um, the results of the test much, much earlier than they have traditionally in the past. Um, just in case people outside of the educational realm don't know what I mean, it is traditionally we don't see the results of the MCAS until the fall. And when we see those results, it makes it very difficult to use that data to inform instructional practices. Um, so we are working very closely with the commissioner to make sure the information and the um, deep dive analysis for our schools and for our students is delivered back to districts in a more timely manner, even to the administrators who do get a sneak peek before the rest of us do. Um, we're trying to get that information in the hands of the teachers as rapidly as possible this year. Okay. That's it for me. Thank you, John. Thank you. Christine. Thank you. The financial tonight, it's in your package. Has everybody had a chance to look at it? Yep. All right. Um, as you can see, we're, it's kind of uneventful. We're, we're making our way through the year and there's not too much to report. Some things that might catch your attention under special education, there appears to be a deficit of, um, under the tuition account, but that will be eliminated once we receive our next circuit breaker payment. So we're projecting that on there will be pretty much coming in at almost zero. We'll have a surplus in transportation and contracted services under special education. And out of district vocational has a surplus of $51,000. And um, you know, John's been looking at that to see how best to use those funds. But that's really it for right now, unless there are any questions. No, okay. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Mr. Lynch. Thank you. I, I've included uh, in your packet a, uh, some bullets on curriculum instruction and assessment. I just wanted to highlight a, a few of those. Um, under, under curriculum development, uh, we've partnered with um, EduPlanet 21 uh, as our curriculum mapping software, and, and we'll have a long-term goal of um, continuing our work with understanding by design. And um, sort of what we learned from the pandemic is that we can both learn um, synchronously in person, but also asynchronously. And, and uh, EduPlanet offers an ability for our staff to learn a little bit about um, understanding by design and looking at model units and aligned curriculum. So we're excited about uh, moving forward um, with that. Underneath instruction, the uh, K through 12 ELA task force has been, uh, was formed earlier this year um, alongside Melissa Farrell, Nicola Fanisev, the, the seven through 12 ELA coordinator and myself, um, along with Martha McBride and Megan Pacinian from, from the Dennett. And um, they've done an, a fantastic job evaluating uh, potential programs for elementary literacy. Um, the four potential programs are on the sheet I provided and, and just before break, um, the group followed a protocol to, to whittle it down to two. Um, collaborative classroom or uh, CKLA. And um, it's been great to work alongside that, that district-wide group and the representatives from, from Dennett. Um, Mr. Benino and Mr. Frazier provided very helpful updates for, for MCAS. Um, so at Dennett, that's May 18th to June 1st. Um, and with some of the grant updates, um, this, um, Mr. Frazier talked about it before. There, there's also the, the total amounts, not only the entitlement grants, but just under ESSER 1 and ESSER 2, what the allocations um, will be for, for Plimpton. Um, and I will also want to give um, some recognition to, to Melissa Farrell for working on the Student Opportunity Act competitive grant. We found out last week that 
uh, then it will be awarded um, $22,942 for research-based literacy programs K3, which will help to support um, professional development um, for teachers at Dennett, um, for new materials for the ELA pilot. So that's very exciting and it's, it's matched with the other two towns as well. So that's very good news to support um, this, this move forward with a new um, elementary literacy program. So again, that's the K through 12 ELA task force and Melissa Farrell's work to complete that grant and submit it. Um, so we're, we're excited about excited about that. Excellent. Any any questions? Jason. I just want to compliment Melissa for all her hard work. Um, she brings in more dollars annually than we pay her in a salary. So much appreciated. Um, even the ones that she doesn't get, I appreciate um, the reasons why she chases certain grants and um, they're always um, you know, deeply rooted in, in the mission of our schools. Um, Ryan, um, do you have a final number on our ESSER three number? I, um, I don't on this handout, but I believe it's 2.2 .2 times ESSER two, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct, I, I'll look it up, um, Jason, for that final number, but it's, it's supposed to be um, twice what ESSER two is. Okay, and, and I'm sure at some high level, you've probably started thinking about how we want, might want to utilize those funds. Um, I just want to think about uh, potentially looking at tiered systems of support and, and how we could potentially utilize that um, to supplement um, some of the areas that we're missing out on in Title I for, for reading uh, literacy, literacy specialists and math interventionist, you know, um, might just be a short term thing. I know we have to be careful of the fiscal cliff when those money sunset, um, you know, that can leave a big hole in the budget if you're not careful of how you use it. Um, but just thinking about some of those potential gaps we might find in students' academic records, um, that might be one way of looking at it. Uh, yes, that's those are really really good points and and um we just began this work um i believe it was two weeks ago we all met to look at the funding streams for our grants um even the, the coronavirus prevention funds and and um tried to strategize which ones end at what point and then what makes the most sense um spending wise and i i think it's it's um you're absolutely right about tiered systems of support for our students and those finding the gaps and getting students what they need. Um, so we'll continue to do uh, that work together. Thank you. Christine. I just wanted to let you know that I did just look up the numbers as um, Ryan mentioned, we had all kind of met to see where we were and what the, how we were gonna move forward. And for Plimpton, SO3 funds right now are estimated at $130,328. Thank you for getting that number, Christine and Brian. I knew, that, I knew the spreadsheet was close. I just had to remember what it was called. No, no, I, I know there's been lots of things flying at us and a lot of these are positive things. So I'm thankful for the confusion when it's good. Um, but Ryan, again, thank you for your, your stewardship of the curriculum and instruction. Um, you're really doing a great job. Appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Jill, we're up to you. Okay, so in your um, packet tonight, uh, there is a April 24th um, budget in the packet, um, circuit breaker, and this version is at 60%. Our out of vocation, out of district vocational line is decreased by one possible position, um, which has brought us to a 3% increase overall. Um, one thing I should note though, is that the deadline for out of district vocational applications is May 1st. So. So we're right back to where we always are, which is <laughs> yes. voting the budget with a couple days left to the deadline. And we thought we were gonna 
missed that this year. But we did, um, in discussions with the Finance Committee, we did end up leaving a, an extra slot in there, not because we knew anything about the extended deadline, because that came after, which is sort of odd since it was already the middle of April, but that came after. But we left it in there uh, for a cushion because we always have the opportunity or the possibility really that, that a student could move in district and already be attending one of the vocational programs, at which point we would be uh, required to, to pay tuition for that. So the Finance Committee felt comfortable um, that we do leave that, uh, that position. I would also note that you know, we've been pretty lean on, on this um, for the last few years. So with that extra position, that's only two, right? Because we only have one student that is, that is scheduled to go back. So it is, we have been very fortunate from a budgetary perspective um, that we end up with surpluses there. And should we get through the May 1st deadline and should we not everyone else move in, then there will be a small surplus there, which has been helpful in years past to be able to, to, to figure things out. Um, but I did want the school committee to know that, that the finance committee was supportive of, of doing it that way. Because if not, we would have dropped that item as well and we would be down to just the one that we are paying for. And that's a little risky. Also, I should note that there was a shared cost. Um, Christine updated the shared cost and that represented a $900 decrease as well. So I didn't know if the committee wanted to entertain any discussion, questions, or even possibly vote the budget tonight and how you wanted us to proceed. Mr. Chair. Um, can I, I was just going to make a comment before you do that. Um, so just, just to level set from where we were with our version one budget, um, you know, we were at 3.97%. And so working with, uh, closely with Christine and getting input from the finance committee, uh, we were able to uh, get that down to a 3% increase, um, which, you know, I think is a, a testament to the careful budgeting and work that Christine does for, for Peter in running a very, very tight ship at, 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 the, at the building for all of the staff for supporting it. And even again, on a, on a year following the pandemic, being able to you know, su support our staff um, and still be able to deliver what I think is a very, very uh, fiscally responsible budget, especially coming off of a year where we had only a 1.6% budget increase. I mean, that just, you just you can't, you can't do that year to year. Um, so I would just throw those thoughts out there and, and thank you to everyone who worked to get this budget where it is. So Mr. Chair, I'd like to um, make our budget motions if there's no further comments from our other committee members who are on tonight. We can proceed. Okay. Um, I make a motion that the Plimpton School Committee approve the 2021-2022 elementary school operating budget of $2,592,806 as the amount deemed necessary for the operation of the regular day. Do I have a second? I will second that. I'll second. Okay, we have a second. Uh, so we'll do a roll call. Uh, Jason? Yes. Dan? Yes. Mike? Yes. And John is a yes. Excellent. I make a motion the Plimpton School Committee approve the 2021-2022 elementary school special ed budget of $1,176,549. Second. I'll second. I will second. Okay, roll call. Jason? Yes. Dan? Yes. Mike? Yes. And John is a yes. I make a motion the Plimpton School Committee approve the 2021-2022 elementary school out of district vocational education budget of $60,000. I will second that. Okay. Now roll call again. Jason? Yes. Dan? Yes. Mike? Yes. And John is a yes. Thank you. Um, and before we leave this topic, I just wanted to run through with the committee what we have put forward. Uh, we have a single 
uh, special town meeting article uh, for folks who aren't uh, sort of familiar with that. We have both an annual town meeting and a special town meeting. Special town meeting starts at eight o'clock and it's usually within, well, it is within the annual town meeting, but it is a separate meeting. It starts at eight o'clock and it deals with monies within the, within the budget for this fiscal year. So that, and, and what we are doing is we are um, basically moving um, monies that we have in surplus in the vocational line and also the, the special education uh, transport line. Uh, and we are utilizing those to do other items that we will accomplish by the end of the fiscal year, June 30th. Um, what this does for us is it, one, it keeps, uh, it, it allows us to use monies already appropriated for the schools to offset costs and, and other improvements that we need to make uh, and doing it within this fiscal year. Um, which means that by the time we're at the end of June, we're all done with these. Um, and it also means that we're not going to the annual town meeting to ask for money for next year for these items. So uh, just to give folks a sort of rundown of what we are asking for, um, we, are, we have a special needs reserve fund, which we put in a couple of years ago. It allows us to put aside 2% of our uh, annual operating budget for regular education. Right, Jason? Net school spending, Christine tells me. Net school spending. 2% right. of net school spending items. Okay, so um, we have maxed that number out, which is not huge, unfortunately, because it's only 2%, but we're in the 40,000 and change number, I believe, 45 or 46,000 in, in that. Um, and uh, because of our increases this year, we are able to add $2,188.88. We had Christine and I had to go through that a couple of times because there were 88s running everywhere. But that's that's what we're doing. We're adding that so that we are at sort of our maximum budget there. These funds can be used for uh, by the school committee working with the Board of Selectmen, I believe, to authorize uh, that money to be used within a school year should we have unexpected expenses within the special education line. So it's it's a good reserve and we've been using We've really been using special education funds or excess funds are really allocated to the school each year to, to, to initially fund that and to top it up so that we have the maximum there. It's a rainy day fund for special education. And while we have not had that be an issue for us in the time that I've been on the committee, I do know that we have had issues in the past. And so this is just, just prudent spending. Uh, we're doing some work on the fire suppression system at the school, I believe, Peter, did that get done uh, over vacation? So that's done. Um, so that's about, that's 83, well, $8,340 that we will be paying that bill with the money. Christine? There is just an update, just in the vein of giving total disclosure. The work that was asked of was completed. Yeah. As they were working on the system, they noted that the floats that were installed in the tank are not the floats that were in the specs for the, the, the facility. Yeah. It is working correctly, so that's not an issue. But the way the floats work, they go up and down a cylinder in the middle. And the problem is the debris collects there. And that's what inhibits the um, floats from moving properly. So all of that has been cleaned. So we should be fine. But Matt has looked into what would it cost to get the correct floats and have those correct floats installed. Okay. And that's about $3,500. But the system is working fine now. Okay, and, so we and, want that, it to be. and that's for a future expenditure. That's an improvement when we can make that. Okay, good. So that's already done. Um, there was a request uh, to finally deal with the uh, driveway and parking lot at the Dennett. Um, it has been it has been a uh, it's been something that I've been concerned about since I've gotten on the school committee because it's been kind of a mess all this time. As you can see, you can see driving up it, we clearly built it in a number of stages as you go up the driveway um, uh, in multiple places. Uh, so uh, for 32,200, we will be uh, seal coating the entire driveway, relining it, um, and also adding some a uh, couple of visitor parking spaces in the front of the building. Uh, and, and that again is funds that we plan on using there. I also have put aside $3,000 for any COVID-19 related expenses with the with moving to a full in-person 
Peter, I'm thinking that may be where we will pay for the tables if we need to. Um, if we get to town meeting and we don't need to do it, we can always we can always make that just pass over that portion of the article. But we do have the funds there, and we also we have that marked, I believe, as COVID related. So that should we be able to do reimbursement, even if we pay for it from here, we can still do reimbursement. The town will get that money back. So that's that's all easy to do. But we wanted to make sure we had that placeholder. Um, I mentioned the tree removal already for 7,500 that is in there. And there was also uh, a decision in working with the town administrator. The uh, highway department is purchasing or needs to purchase a mower to help with the mowing of the fields. Uh, and since we have excess funds here, we agreed to put that into the uh, into this article as well. So that's for 8,500. And then finally, uh, the we have in here a, and this again, I'm going to make sure that this is abundantly clear. This is what we are putting forward in the warrant article. This does not mean it will pass, but we are going to do everything we can to make sure that all of these requests pass. We have put in a um, $20,000 uh, as a, I guess I will call it a COVID-19 uh, thank you payment for all the building staff. And so there's 40 folks that work in the Dennett building. That would be a $500 one-time payment. Um, it is something that I felt was incredibly important given how much everybody has given over the last year plus um, and just a way for the town to be able to say thank you with existing school funds. Um, I will note that uh, the finance committee met on Wednesday uh, last week and they did not vote to support that part of the article. So that will, that's how that warrant will read. The selectmen, would, we're gonna to vote tonight. I do not have a understanding of how they came out on that, but I did spend time before I jumped on this meeting to explain to them why we think it is, it is valid. Uh, I will note that the finance committee, although I did not, was not able to, I did not attend the meeting because I didn't know it was happening, but um, the finance committee did say that they weren't uh, unsupportive of the article because of what we were trying to do, but they thought it was an issue of fairness for all town employees. I don't agree with them on that, um, and we will have to have the discussion on town meeting floor. So that said, for the folks that are on, on this meeting and for anyone who watches this meeting, um, if we want to make sure we get this through, then we need to make sure that people show up at town meeting to vote it. Um, and as, as I said, the uh, special town meeting is at 8 p.m., um, and on Mar that is May 12th. Town meeting starts at seven, at eight we adjourn and we go into special and we'll go through the 11 articles that are on there. And this is article number 11, which is, includes all of those items. But my guess is, is we're gonna end up voting them in, in uh, not necessarily all together. So with all that, are there questions? And I did not spend all the money. There's sixteen thousand two hundred and seventy-one dollars and twelve cents. That, uh, based on the estimates that we have, that are going back, the number may round a little differently. But about sixteen thousand dollars will still go back to the town, uh, and be available for them next year to be able to access for funds. Okay. Now that I stole half of Jill's time, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it back to her, and I'm going to let the dog out because he wants to go outside. So please. <laughs> <go ahead. laughs> so. Um... Not in your packet. I don't believe it was in your packet. So I sent you out an email just prior to the meeting tonight, some potential quarantine language um, for staff members who um, are not um, covered by the memorandum of agreement um, type of language that uh, some of our staff members have. The quarantine language um, would state if an employee is quarantined, which is defined herein as meaning a medical official has determined the employee is not able to leave their home because of the virus, because the employee has the virus or has been exposed to it through someone who does, the employee cannot go on school grounds or enter any school building until cleared by a medical official or meeting the recommended time period for absence from the Center for Disease Control or other governmental agencies. If the employee is quarantined as provided above, the employer may use the employee's accrued and unused sick leave during the quarantine time period. If an employee intentionally causes the employee's quarantine by going out of state or to a foreign country where 
where under state or federal laws require a quarantine, the employee will be placed in an unpaid leave status during the required quarantine period. If the staff member is, and this is uh, the, the section that other school districts have, have varied. So uh, I, I placed it in blue because it varies from district to district. If the staff member is considered a close contact due to exposure at the school, the employee shall be granted up to 10 calendar days to quarantine and will not be required to use their personal sick days. So there's two things I wanna point out here in particular. One is that under quarantine is not considered a sick day. So um, we needed to one, consider how we could create language so that people could use their sick time because we didn't want people who needed to quarantine coming into school when they should be staying away from other people. Um, and then the, the second part is for those, um, for those staff members who are quarantined because of a close contact at school, other school committees have given um, a quarantine period uh, for staff members so that uh, if they either didn't have sick time or if they uh, needed sick time, they could use that so that they wouldn't come into school if they were in fact a close contact. So um, that's just language for your consideration. Uh, again, it is something that other school committees have voted on and put into place for staff members. And I wanted to bring it to your attention uh, for consideration for uh, Plimpton staff. Any committee thoughts on that? Um, I think it sounds fair and equitable. It, it makes sense the way it's delineated between different occurrences of why somebody would be put into quarantine. Some is just incidental daily life. The other is willful travel to a place where, you know, we, we don't necessarily want our staff going. And the third is a close contact caused by, um, you know, carrying out their duties as one of our staff members. So um, I, I like the way it's broken down. I understand the, the rationale behind it. Um, I don't see any area I disagree with personally. And I, I, I might have just missed a little piece of that. Did you say that if a person has uh, is under quarantine, that the, the district will be able to administer vacation, accrued vacation time or sick time? Or was that the employee, the staff member? The beginning of what you had said, I, I, I missed that little piece. Oh, so currently quarantine is not considered a sickness. So okay. to say, I'm going to take a sick day because I have to quarantine, we didn't really have a mechanism. So, at the very beginning, you, you talked about, at the very, very beginning of the breakdown, you had said something. And I, I thought you said that, that the um, administration would have the ability to put them on uh, sick time. So if the employee is quarantined, the mm -hmm. employee may use the employee's accrued and unused sick leave during the quarantine time period. Okay. But if an employee intentionally causes the employee's quarantine by going out of state or to a foreign country where under state or federal law is requires a quarantine, the employee will be placed, uh, excuse me, will be placed in an unpaid leave status during the required quarantine period. Yeah, I got the, I got the last of it. I just missed that very first section. Right. I almost thought I heard you say that the administration would be able to administer basically against their will. You could tell them that they're using their sick time, but it, it's their option is what you're saying. Under the circumstances that they were quarantined other than their own negligence traveling out of state or out of country or yes okay i just want to make sure they weren't going to be forced to use their sick time if they were quarantined if they wanted to take the two weeks off without sick time they have that option yes okay i, I just misunderstood it when you said it i apologize any other any other comments or questions I mean, I agree with Jason. It, I mean, it makes sense, and I think it's, I think it's fair. I think it's, um, you know, it fits the spirit of what we've been doing all along here. Um, if there's an exposure at school that requires quarantining, we shouldn't be penalizing teachers for that uh, or any other staff. Um, and I do think, but I think you know now, now that the rules keep changing, this is probably going to be less important. 
I think there's also, isn't there CDC guidance that if, if you are fully vaccinated and you have a close contact that you're not required as a teacher to quarantine as well? I believe so. I think so. So, you know, regardless of that, this is, to me, this is the right thing to do. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly in favor of, of approving this. And Jill, you would want to vote from us on this? Yes, please. So I would I would look for a motion to uh, to um, approve the uh, the languages as, as submitted by Jill. So moved. I have a second. Second. Okay. Do a roll call. Jason. Yes. Dan. Yes. Mike. Yes. And John is a yes as well. Okay. The next item is the school calendar. Um, it's a in your packet, and you'll notice that um, the half days are on Wednesdays in keeping with the way that we scheduled half days uh, this year. Uh, we reviewed that with the principals in our administrative leadership team, and we all liked the consistency of that. Um, we didn't have any issues with the Wednesday half days, and so we were looking to maintain that this year. You'll also notice um, the the uh, five days are underscored at the end of the school year um, in part uh, to denote the um, five potential snow days, but also because of our new policy ICICA, where the school committee shall schedule a school year which includes at least 185 school days for each school in the district. So we we have our five days underscored here in compliance with our new policy. And also new to our calendar is the state um, observation on June 20th of Juneteenth, a, uh, a new holiday. So that is that also appears on the calendar. Um, the calendar is here, um, would need to be voted by every school committee before it becomes the, the, uh, the calendar for the entire Silver Lake and Union 31. Um, happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, but I'm also hoping for a vote tonight, if possible. It's funny what happens when Labor Day is as late as it can be. <laughs> Jill, have you gotten um, any of the other committees to already approve? They have. All three of them? Yes. Okay. No pressure there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not. <laughs> All right, well, I would look for a motion to approve the uh, draft school calendar for 2021-2022 school year. So moved. I'll second that. Okay, I'm getting good at this. Roll call, Jason? Yes. Dan? Yes. Mike? Yes. And John is a yes. You have Great, a school calendar. You. I appreciate that. Um, the next item is a discussion and a possible vote of a one-time vacation rollover. So last year, uh, the school committee graciously agreed to roll over vacation time for staff uh, because of the pandemic. Um, probably a, a, a month, at least a month ago, uh, I was approached by one um, association and one town that was considering rolling over vacation days this year. Um, and so in your packet, you'll find a, a, a sh very short list of a number of people with a vacation balance. Um, and I'm asking the committee if they would consider a possible one-time carryover to be used by June 30th of 2022. Some school committees have placed a cap on the amount of days to carry over um, this has also been presented to other school committees, so just in full disclosure, um, that may or may not be something that you want to consider. <clears throat> that is not um, something I'm willing to consider. You know, I, I, I looked at this chart and I was amazed um, by how, how few days the staff of the Dennett took during one of the most stressful years that we've ever been through. Um, I think they deserve every single day on that list. And uh, the fact that they didn't take it, we all needed mental health days this year. By looking at that, that list of how many days that many of our staff members still have left that they could take, 
It just tells me about their dedication, the fact that they showed up every day and gave 100%. And I think that's why we should move to give them 100% of their days to carry over in this one time situation. I agree with that. Um, couldn't have said it better. Um, you know, I remember the, the months on these meetings where Peter dreaded having to make these phone calls that he was canceling third grade, fourth grade, or fifth grade, or, or whatnot, because he was too short of teachers, you know, just with nobody in reserve to fill these classes. And uh, it, it wouldn't matter to me if every teacher in that school had time to roll over. I would agree with Jason 100%. They earned the time, and they graciously didn't take it. And in some industries and other towns, I'm sure, um, people don't care. They'll, they'll take their time and make sure they get their time if there's any chance of losing it. And, you know, this just goes to the, uh, the character of the, the people that we have in our school. And, and uh, I don't think in any way, shape or form, we should short them. Yeah, I, I'm in complete agreement. Um, and just, you know, <clears throat> hopefully just, I, I would just highlight that point that we have had many a day uh, in this school year where we were to the last person um, <clears throat> things were shutting down and here we are on the 26th of April and I'm not sure that Peter in any of the conversations you and I had over the summer or in the early fall that we thought we'd make it like this getting through um, but it really is to the dedication of the staff um, and that is why I'm I will be pushing hard for that uh, modest payment um, and why I also think we should we should move ahead with this. Um, that said, um, I do also hope that some of the folks that were rolling over this time that you're able to find the, find the opportunity, especially this summer, to take some of this time and <coughs> get a break because I think I think we all need a break. <laughs> Even if we've had one, we probably need one again after a couple of days. So, but it, I think it's really important. Um, I'm going to entertain a motion to to. Uh, go ahead and approve the uh, one-time uh, rollover through the end of the 2022 school year, right? I think that's the right way to do it. So moved. Second. We'll do a roll call. Jason? Absolutely. Dan? Absolutely. Mike? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So, good. Thank you very, thank you on behalf of the Dennett Elementary staff. That is, um, thank you for your generosity and I'm certain that they will appreciate uh, your vote this evening. Last item on my agenda is the district update. Um, I am happy to note that the middle school uh, has started their five days in person schedule this, this Monday um, and they had a successful first day. Our high school is scheduled to reopen five days a week, the first week of May. Um, the USDA has extended all of the current waivers for school meals. And this means that we would be allowed to operate a summer meals program and claim the meals for reimbursement like we did last summer. Um, our nutrition director, Megan Aronholtz, is, uh, would like to send out a survey to parents to gauge interest. And if there is interest, she would like to operate out of Kingston Intermediate School, Silver Lake Regional Middle School, um, and Halifax Elementary School, so that families will have sites closer to where they live. And each program has an opportunity to earn reimbursements. Um, she did not list Dennett Elementary School on this list, but if you would like that to be considered, that's certainly something I could also talk to her about. But I think she's just trying to create locations that are closer for parents to pick up um, and uh, she's and looking for basically your, uh, any questions or concerns that you might have with her moving forward with looking at the feasibility of this type of summer meals program once again. And just to clarify, Jill, I mean, that, that's the, those are the pickup locations that we're already using. Yes. We, we, we haven't done Dennett uh, since last summer, I think, right? Yeah. That, that's my understanding. Right. And um, Jill, I, I would just ask that when John conveys the Plimpton Town report for the Plimpton School Committee that you get Megan and, um, and Steve Pello a copy because those are two of our biggest unsung heroes. What Megan did once school shut down last year, 
Um, she jumped right into action. She spoke truth to power and got kids fed all across our three towns. Um, it, it was amazing work. And uh, for her to be able to continue that, and for the USDA to extend free lunches to all of our children in our three communities uh, is tremendous. Um, I hope they consider making this a permanent um, fixture of the USDA program. But Megan, Megan's been a rock star for, for all of us and we appreciate her deeply. Absolutely. I, I don't think we have any questions and it, it, it just, from my perspective, it just makes sense to keep moving ahead. It's very successful and, and to Jason's point, I mean, we, we sort of pushed ahead with this in, in March of last year before we knew what the USDA was doing and it, you know, because it was the right thing to do. And it was very helpful that they decided to do that because it didn't put budgetary constraints on us. But if folks remember, we actually had a, had a line item in the, uh, in the special town meeting warrant to have to put some money toward that if we needed to. And luckily we were able to pass over that. So thank you. Thank you. Anything that's, else? That's, that's it for tonight. Okay, I have uh, two more items before we end. Um, uh, this is most likely our last school committee meeting with Mike Antone. Uh, Mike has served for two terms uh, on the committee, six years. I've had the pleasure of working with him here and uh, he is fulfilling his second term as of mid-May uh, the 15th. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank him for being a dedicated uh, community member, dedicated school committee member, um, you know, showing up here um, and, and, and being part of this committee. And, and it really for, for me, uh, having been a chair for many of these, well, for all of these years, Mike, um, you know, someone I can depend on and also someone I can seek guidance from and, 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 and thoughtful insight. So thank you for your time and, and we appreciate it. Um, and it's, we look, for, I look forward to working with you on other committees over in the future after you get a little break. <laughs> no, thank you for those kind words, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank, um, you know, the residents of Plimpton for, for voting for me over the years. Um, I definitely will miss um, all of you. Um, gained um, some great friendships. So, um, and Peter, knowing Peter for so long, um, you know, Hannah's gonna be a senior next year. So that's how, how long I've known Peter for. Um, yeah, uh, I will definitely um, miss everyone. The, uh, the shredder is already uh, warming up. So uh, we'll be making some room in the house. So, um, and thanks, I appreciate that. So good luck. I, I, I wish the new members um, uh, well and um, uh, the new committee is, is um, as good as this one here because um, uh, I listened to a lot of the other meetings in, in the different towns in Plimpton. This committee here um, definitely uh, comes together on a lot of things, um, supports um, the staff um, tremendously as much as we can. I um, mean, I think they would agree to that. So uh, thank you, I appreciate it, so. Okay, um, we are gonna have to entertain a motion for executive session, but before we do that, does anyone else have any other comments or, or, or thoughts before we move to uh, go into executive session and adjourn this? Uh, Mike, Mike already knows I love him, but um, are we returning to regular to take a vote in public tonight or is it just to, um, for adjournment. What's the best way to do that, Jill? You, if you're going, if you're going to vote it, typically you would come back out and vote in public. Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I had it correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jill. And Sorry, Dan, you, I, I didn't realize you were speaking. Oh no, that's okay. I was just going to uh, wish Mike well in his future endeavors and thank him for all his time and service in the town, uh, even before I got involved. But um, I haven't met you in person, but I'm sure I, I will at some point. You can throw a stone and clear half the town. <laughs> Jill, is I'd there... like to 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to thank Mike for his support. He's been wonderful and it's been a, a difficult year for everyone, um, but especially to a new team. Uh, and for me in my, my first year as superintendent, I have um, drawn great strength and comfort from having him on the team. So I, I appreciate him and will certainly miss him. So back to the executive, is there any, is there any issue with us doing the public vote in June? At the June meeting, I'm just trying to think of it logistically with Zoom and 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 how we jump out to a separate. We can do it if we need to and leave this leave this one. Uh, I can leave this one open and use a different computer to jump in. Um, but it it I may screw it up since I'm tired. <laughs> uh, so, so John, it, what my my only concern with that is. Uh, the committee will have changes okay. between now and the June meeting and the people yep. who vote tonight in executive will not be the same people who vote June meeting. So I don't know if that, that follows Robert's rules. I believe we have to do the difficult computer switch out. Okay, well, that's what I'm doing right now. So, um... All right, so I guess we will, I will keep this, I will keep, the goal is is to keep this running. Um, and I will do that and leave this up here. So if anyone is so endeavored to, to sit and look at a blank meeting for five or 10, 15 minutes, then you're welcome to do that. I don't think it's gonna be a very long session, but we will, why don't we, from a motion perspective, Jason, we'll, we'll plan to come back. And I make a motion to enter into executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations with the Plimpton Teachers Association and AIDS pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21E3, <clears throat> and to potentially vote on said negotiations, only to return to regular session to vote in public and to adjourn then from our regular session. I have a second. I'll second that. Okay. Um, do a roll call, Jason. Yes. Uh, Dan. Yes. Mike. Yes. And John is a yes. Okay. So I think that um, that does it for for us tonight. Well, it does it for this for the moment. So we're gonna we're gonna leave and go to executive session. Folks are welcome to stay here, and we will come back. Um, we will come back before we before we adjourn this meeting. Um, and I think everyone who needs to be in the executive session was sent an email from me about half an hour, forty five minutes ago, with that link in it. So I will see you guys over there. And for anyone who's staying on, we will we will be back and um, let you know. You'll have to okay. let me back into this one uh, afterwards, John. I'm gonna okay. log off of this one and get on the other one. And yeah, yeah, yep, yep. So you should be able, to, you should be able just to still click on that link because this will still yep. be running. So okay. I'm not gonna get rid of this. Thank you. Thanks. Right. So yeah, for all of us, you'll need to get off and then go over there, and then we'll come back into this one. But I'll leave it up. All right. Thank you, folks, for attending. Um, and I'm going to uh, pause the recording here, and we'll go from there. All right. Thanks. All right. We're back from executive session. Uh, again, the school committee meeting of the 26th of April. Um, and we did take a vote on the uh, contract with the teachers. Um, and uh, the committee voted the contract as recommended by the subcommittee. Um, and do we typically, I'm just, well, I'm burned out. Do we typically say anything more than that? Um, yeah, so we did a um, couple of, what, Jill? Sorry, you voted in public session. Oh, we got to vote it in public session. That's right. See, I'm I'm done. Okay. <laughs> this, is like, this is like Mark Russo after eight o'clock. Apparently, I'm following his. <laughs> although he was up a lot earlier than I was today, um, so we need to vote. We need to vote the contract. Um, Jason, would you like to make a motion? Absolutely. Thank you. So I would like to make a motion that the Plimpton School Committee accept the agreement with the Plimpton Teachers Association for um, their contract for one year um, as agreed upon by the subcommittee. Second. Okay. First and a second, we'll do a roll call. Jason? 
Yes. Dan. Yes. Mike. Yes. And I am enthusiastically a yes. So that is that. Um, I, I would just like to just note that this was a, um, this was for, from a negotiation perspective, this was actually a pleasure to work with the teachers to come to, the, to, come to this agreement. Um, and, and it was, um, I thank them for their dedication, both to working through the agreement, but also to everything that they've done all year. Um, and know that the school committee is, is fully in support. Um, and uh, we, put, we get what, six months off and can start again? Mm -hmm. So uh, there we go. <laughs> um, can John, I just want to say thank you again from the teachers. We feel the same way. It's been, I feel like we were working together, which has meant a lot for us, especially through this year. Um, I feel like working together, we can get more done. And I think um, we have a very supportive uh, administration and school committee, and we truly appreciate it. And um, Mr. Antoine, I just want to say thank you from the teachers for your time and dedication to the school committee as well. We appreciate everything you guys do for us, your volunteers, and you work countless hours to make our school and our community a better place. And so thank you so much. You're certainly welcome. My pleasure. Now, when you say volunteers, you, you mean we don't get a check at the end of the school year? <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Sorry. They, don't tell you, they don't tell you that uh, when you first get on the committee. <laughs> yeah, they saw me coming. <laughs> okay. I think we're good. Hey, Mike, why don't you make the motion to adjourn? I have to make the motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Go ahead, Jason. I'll, I'll take my place as the junior person on the committee. And I'll, I'll I'd be love talking. to second that, Mike. And thank you, Dan, for letting me do that. All right. Uh, so we have a first and a second, and that's all we need. Mike, thanks for being part of this. Thank you, everyone, for coming back. And uh, have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.